The inset map shows us the Emperor chain of the Hawaiian Islands, Oahu where all the flights land, and Hawaii, the big island, and on the south coast of Hawaii, Volcanoes National Park is in fact the area of the entire map, Volcanoes National Park. The purpose of looking at the map is to orient ourselves on some of the features. We are looking at the southern part of the island, which is Kilauea Volcano, one of the five volcanoes on the island. And in this program, we will look at features from A to B down to the coastline C. And this pathway is, of course, not a straight line, but it's one that the lava seems to follow from all of the work that the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is doing. It starts here at the caldera in Kilauea at A, and inside the caldera, which is the fire pit, there's yet another fire pit called Hale Mau Mau, and the lava is perhaps only one kilometer, two kilometers, something like a mile, just below the floor of Hale Mau Mau. And apparently it drains uh, outward from that magma to a place here at B called Pu'u O'o, where for over 20 years there's been a crater erupting. Uh, sometimes the crater blows itself apart, but when it overflows it makes a lava lake and it in turn overflows and the lavas that you can see here in the shaded area over a period of 20 years have gone down and destroyed several towns along the coast. If you notice the red road <laughs> abruptly stops right there where I'm pointing. Uh, the lava has covered the road on numerous occasions and so now the road stops right here and it used to go on around the coast uh, to Hilo. And so from Pu'u O'o, the, you might say, leaky surface uh, exit of the lava, it runs down the slope um, and ends up here in the ocean. Uh, quite beautiful display. The footage that you will see is safe in some senses, at least to be taken, because the fluidity of the basalt here in Hawaii means that it's not terribly explosive and Terribly, of course, means dangerously. The idea that you will see some very violent heaves of magma, uh, it is still very fluid, and so people can approach even the hot molten material uh, fairly closely without the kind of danger that would occur if it was more stiff and sputtering, perhaps like oatmeal uh, cooking on a stove. schematic of the profile of Kilauea as we saw in a previous view of the aerial map from A, the caldera, to B, Pu'u'o'o, a leak event, down to C, uh, the ocean entry of lava that escapes. And so magma coming from the hot spot underneath Hawaii comes up into a near summit reservoir. Here's the caldera. At the moment, lava is not intersecting the surface, but it certainly has many times in the past. But there is molten lava here where it's not shaded about a mile below the summit. And it leaks sideways. Notice the break in horizontal scale here. Um, we wanted to show more detail on over to the right. So this distance, as we're saying, from A here to B is in fact about 10 miles. And from B here on down to the ocean entry is about uh, seven miles. But back to Pu'u'o'o, the lava is leaking out. Sometimes there's a cinder cone, sometimes there's a small lava lake. It overflows, has been doing this for 20 years, and flow after flow after flow, as the schematic art is trying to show, has gone down. The flows cap themselves with crossing over and then run out from under themselves, thus making lava tubes. 
occasionally the cross breaks open and one gets skylights and then it comes to what may have been many hundred thousand years ago the original edge of the island the cliff and it increases in speed as it goes down the steeper portion then comes to a bench and forms uh, new land essentially out into uh, the ocean as you'll see in some of the footage that we'll show there are bench cracks and sometimes these bench portions slump down because the water depth here in the ocean is about uh, 3,000 feet. We'll return quite a few times to this schematic cross-section to show you these features as we go through this. Uh, recall that we started at the top of this profile and we've already looked at Hale Mau Mau and how the lava ascends from deep inside the earth leaks sideways over to Pu'u O'o and so what we will do is examine the features along this profile Post an HVO, the conning tower as it were looks like an airport tower looking down over Hale Mau crater with some of the visitors. While this pan around at Hale Mau Mau looks fairly extinct, when the missionaries first came to Hawaii in the 1800s, there are sketches where there were maybe as many as 13 bubbling pots of molten magma here on the floor of Hale Mau Mau. And as you've just seen, geophysics shows that it's not far out of sight just below the surface of the bottom of this fire pit. So let's return again to the ABC profile line and look at it. B, Pu'u O'o, a leak event, down to C, uh, the ocean entry of lava that escapes. And so magma coming from the hot spot underneath Hawaii comes up into a near summit reservoir. Here's the caldera. At the moment, lava is not intersecting the surface, but it certainly has many times in the past. But there is molten lava here where it's not shaded about a mile below the summit. And it leaks sideways. Notice the break in horizontal scale here. Um, we wanted to show more detail on over to the right. So this distance, as we're saying, from A here to B is in fact about 10 miles. Oh, the lava is leaking out. Sometimes there's a cinder cone, sometimes there's a small lava lake or fountain. It overflows, has been doing this for 20 years. If we take from the archives at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory some of the archived footage and begin thinking about this problem, where did the Hawaiian volcanoes come from? Here in an aerial overflight is a circular path being taken around Pu'u O'o, one of the vents on Kilauea, and we're seeing a volcanic eruption in progress. So our first clue comes from what has already been said, that there is volcanicity here in Hawaii. As the caption is telling you, this is just one of many episodes of eruption that have occurred out of the same vent, the Pu'u O'o vent. The volcanologist would call such an eruption a sub-aerial eruption, which is just a long way of saying it's under the air, sub-aerial. But the Hawaiian Islands, as we saw from the Marie Tharp map, must have started underwater and built their way up. So the magma has to be coming from deeper inside the earth and pouring out in eruptions 
such as we're seeing here, that is subaerial. The subaerial eruptions cool fairly slowly. We see that the lava is still red hot with just a somewhat black crust over it here in this channel. If, on the other hand, we think of some of the submarine eruptions where you'd have to go down with a submarine to see it, in other words, eruptions on the floor of the ocean, instead of a helicopter, you use a submarine, you would find that these quench very much faster in the cold water as they pour out on the floor of the ocean. But it still would take a long time, as the caption is telling you, to build up flow after flow and pile up about 3,000 feet of lava so that it changed from being submarine to subaerial. By contrast, we're seeing here that the flow is continuing on down the slope with some fair amount of velocity, not quenched like it would be underwater. Underwater, it would still take many cubic kilometers of lava to be added and many such flows, as the caption says, to build up the island from the depth of the water around Hawaii. When geologists talk long and short times, it's not in terms of human lifetimes, but usually more like millions of years of processes that need to accumulate. Since it's easier to study subaerial eruptions, let us take a look at one such episode happening at Pu'u'o'o, where many such episodes have occurred in the last couple of decades. The lava here is fountaining, being driven up by gas pressure, and perhaps also other types of flow pressure, and building, as it falls back, a cinder cone that we can look down from an aerial overview in this view. On the floor of Kukuoko, periodically lava oozes out and it's not fountain, and like almost filling a bathtub, begins to fill the caldera of the fire pit inside the cone that it has built earlier spattered in ashes. Here is one such very dramatic episode. Again, notice how quickly the red lava freezes up across the surface. At least skin deep, it has become cold and black. Depending on the depth of the lava that may be accumulating in this lake, which it really is a lava lake, it may take decades for it to cool to the bottom. Studies done in Hawaii by the HBO staff at a place called Makapui Lava Lake showed it was 300 feet deep and its cooling may have taken 30 to 40 years. As we're seeing, on the floor of Kuku'o'o, at a time when it crossed over strongly enough that it was safe to go into the crater, we're seeing these chimney-like spirals build up by a single crack perhaps in the crust of the floor, which begins to ease the Perhaps think of it as a safety valve and pressure system. The lava that's under the cold crust still has pressure inside of it, and perhaps even new arriving lava. So this is like a leaky uh, crust.
of the HVO workers had spread some glass wool as a landing pad, you might say, for the spatter shooting out of the hornito. And as the glass quenched into some really fantastic shapes here, which he put on display in the lobby of HVO. We just put a quarter in the picture in case you were having trouble understanding the scale of these pieces of spatter that had been produced in the footage that we were watching previously. In volcanology, it's often the scale factors that are somewhat confusing, particularly if you've never been there. Here we are, as you see with a person for scale, standing on the rim of Pu'u'o'o at one time in history, and at the base of the filling in the wall floor contact, another crack apparently has opened, and escaping gas is making almost like a fountain or a fire hydrant splashing of the red-hot molten lava. The lava is probably somewhere around 1100 centigrade, and the safe ability to come on the rim at this quiescent point when it's not fountaining like we've seen in much more active moments uh, in historic tape and make observations and it also helps as we said understand the size of this vent called Pu'u'o'o. As you look around the walls you can see a high water mark <laughs> looks like a dirty ring in a bathtub doesn't it? Where the black lava from this episode has already filled and as the caption saying note levels layers uh, white and red and so forth from previous episodes and in this particular time in history the sidewall has clearly been blown out by a more violent heave during one of the episodes so gas smoke is escaping uh, the ground here in this footage is showing freshly quenched bathtub filling as we jokingly have called it and now and again it continues to crack open and the lava will issue out and as we look at this a bit you will see that it's actually uh, looking very minor according to the scale of the volcano but as this pours out and down it is doing its own bit certainly about filling this chamber also. As the caption has urged you to think about, where is this lava coming from that keeps seeping up through the floor of Pu'u'o'o? Maybe it's coming from deep, because that's how we think the Hawaiian Islands are forming, but Hawaiian Volcano Observatory has done a lot of work to show that it's a more complicated story than just a simple plumbing system coming from deep up and out <laughs> in one clear shot. It apparently is coming up and ponding underneath the island of Hawaii at a more shallow depth and from there erupting uh, on a more frequent basis. Again, notice how the leakage is making a flow out onto the floor of Pu'u'o'o. We need though to go back to our thought of a paragraph ago, where is this really coming from? How complicated is its volcanic process? And so with that in mind, let's go back a little bit in history for 10 or 20 years and see some of the, you know, has this Pu'u'o'o process been constant over the last couple decades? To do that, we can go into the hallways at HVO and see some of the wonderful displays of archived photographs recounting the history of the Pu'u'o'o, shall we call it, volcanic process. Let me read to you this caption. These two photographs, taken at the same scale from a photo station west of Pu'u'o'o, illustrate both the collapse of the cone and the growth of the episode 50 through 55 lava shield. Here in June 1992, a typical episode of growth and buildup of the Pu'u'o'o vent cone, and in its companion 
pair photograph coming up on screen, you see quite a different profile so that by August 1997, after a few additional episodes of eruption in Pu'u'u'u, this is what the profile looked like. If we now overfly uh, in another archive photograph and see uh, a time when Pu'u'u'u was filling and then yet another time when it erupts, one can gather all of these episodes from a professional paper done by Christine Halaiker. So we've spent some time looking at one of these events, Pu'u'u'u, but it turns out there are at least four other active volcanoes on Hawaii. Here in a 3D map, you can see the main ridge on the south center is Mauna Loa, and some of the other volcanoes also red. And flow after flow after flow, as the schematic art is trying to show, has gone down. The flows cap themselves with crusting over and then run out from under themselves, thus making lava tubes. Occasionally the crust breaks open and one gets skylights. And then it comes to what may have been many hundred thousand years ago, the original edge of the island, called the Pali. But before it gets to that break and slope and speeds up, it's on the flanks and it builds up typical shield kind of flows and these flows crossed over and yet may still have a collapse of the roof to show these kind of skylights which we've already mentioned. As we zoom in and look you can see uh, hang down pieces of the cooled lava almost like cave formation but below that is still the red hot lava and if you watch carefully you can see it flowing past this window or this skylight. These flows as the schematic showed continue over a period of years building on top of each other as they in fact cool and the next episode issues forth from the vent upslope. These skylights are interesting in that they are windows into the process and the crust that you see one of the HVO staff members standing on is in fact part of the story, an important part of the story, because it's a fairly good insulator. You see just a few feet of lava and he's able to stand on top of it without burning himself. And this fact that it crusts over and self-insulates allows the lava to travel with its fluidity and low viscosity and insulated roof for quite a distance on down the slope of the volcano from Pu'u'u'u on down to the Pali itself. When it reaches the Pali there is a break in slope and the idea is much higher gradient and we're looking downslope now to the break at the Pali and on downslope even further to the ocean shore. As the lava goes down the poly, it speeds up and of course the heat of the lava is terrible on the environmental success of the forest there. It may be helpful to return again to the schematic profile. Let's do that. The flows cap themselves with crusting over and then run out from under themselves thus making lava tubes. Occasionally the crust breaks open and one gets skylights and then it comes to what may have been many hundred thousand years ago, the original edge of the island, the cliff, and it increases in speed as it goes down the steeper portion, then comes to a bench and forms uh, new land essentially out into uh, the ocean. As you'll see in some of the footage that we'll show, there are bench cracks and sometimes these bench portions slump down because the water depth here in the ocean is about uh, 3,000 feet. We have worked our way down onto the bench and if we turn around and look back up slope from the ocean and the bench we can see that the lava is arriving having been speeded up a little bit by the flow down the poly but then it gets to the bench, slows down 
and eventually creeps on out and oozes over the bench into the ocean, making copious steam as it loses its heat and boils the ocean water. Let's watch this process as this pahoehoe flow comes creeping forward in daylight. Again, let's see this on the profile so we understand it. And then it comes to what may have been many hundred thousand years ago, the original edge of the island, the cliff, and it increases in speed as it goes down the steeper portion, then comes to a bench and forms uh, new land essentially out into uh, the ocean. As you'll see in some of the footage that we'll show, there are bench cracks and sometimes these bench portions slump down because the water depth here in the ocean is about uh, 3,000 feet. While the National Park is very permissive of tourists walking out onto this and watching, you see in the picture, in the center of the picture, a crack which is essentially separating part of what is built out and this whole ocean side may slump into the ocean. And while the park is permissive, as we said, they must monitor this when it's happening because if some tourists were to be standing there, they could <laughs> find themselves swoosh down into 3,000 feet of water. So here one of the park personnel is actually measuring the opening of that crack. Here is a sketch modified after Moore and others, 1972, and Peterson, 1976, showing how this shelf builds out at the edge. In a few moments later in this tape, you will get to see this process actually happening in the daylight and in the dark. Again, let's return to the ABC cross-section and review what we've said. We're right here at the edge of the bench, and as the lava goes on into the ocean in our schematic, it drops below sea level and balls up into balls of lava that quench other pieces of the lava get spattered out as steam and violent reactions occur. Maximum depth here of the underwater structure is about 25 feet. So still probably taking the second, it's the third day of the eruption, looking back up again toward the surface. Sometimes you see the clouds here are, are very dramatic. That's where matter is uh, hitting the ocean. I have a lot of topside material of uh, this eruption too. Uh, which I haven't got around to taping yet, probably will be available on another tape. These are Moorish idols, which are not much bothered by this lava activity. Uh, not sure what that little fish is. Uh, kind of a close-up shot. Looking up the slope again here toward the... Uh, there's a little kind of a... It looks almost like a bird fluttering through the water there. Uh, and actually, it's apparently some, some little bit of light, fluffy lava material. That's the reason for using that particular scene. Uh, back here to pillow lava formation. And a lot of sputtering, a lot of bubbling, a lot of smoke or steam coming out, uh, much more so than in the earlier uh, material done 12, 13 years ago, and you'll see that later on. And uh, less and much less molten lava in, in these uh, pillow formations. Every once in a while, it will turn red. Again, this is a will be a third or fourth generation tape, even one generation more if considered the original was done on sixteen millimeter film. pillows forming at once here, one just below the window, uh, the one in the lower right sort of stopped just as we started filming. Material spurting out from the top of the pillow. Spitting out a little a couple of rocks there. On to another scene. The implosions which caused the pillow to collapse every once in a while, the lower pillow Another pillow forming higher up and a big portion breaking loose, moving down the slope here, very ragged looking. A lot of 
popping and bubbling. Some molten lava, the whole thing collapses, implodes, falls down the slope, opens up. You see molten lava as it uh, pours down the slope, breaks loose, seems to catch a tremendous amount of popping and sputtering. As we see this waterfront fireworks, you see a lot of stuff flying through the air and plunging into the ocean as spatter. And this would be called pyroclastic, meaning broken by fire. And the piling up of this on the coastal front we've seen in a previous cross section. The deposit of that on the cliff below the water makes it have a new name in geological terminology, hyoclastite, and it's a type of rock that has been water quenched and put together under water. Here we see the water is uh, perhaps somewhat trapped in the spatter cone that's building right at the edge. The lava runs out with enough gusto, with enough volume, that it protrudes just to the edge and if you recall in the preceding profile by Patterson and Moore and others, tubes tend to go down and again the insulation power of the tube, uh, but when the tube hits the water, uh, the water leaks in, it causes expansion, it causes this almost explosive, and if you look at the four walls of this spatter cone, they are all rubble, completely fragmented pieces of lava the Polynesian belief in Paley, they call this essentially Paley's lettuce because they spatter out in large broad leaves and quench that way. The Polynesian word, if I remember right, is lemu, and what we're seeing is that kind of spatter built up. As this drops off into the water and quenches, again the shape is preserved to some extent until the waves pound it apart at least, and it prograde's on out, making up perhaps a very loose, slippery slope in the current use of the word slippery. Very jagged, of course, so we're just being cute when we say slippery. And these jaggedy fragments build, as you saw in Lee Tapley's footage, the pillow basalts come out as big blobs, and they tend to form a round ball, and this is because of the surface tension of the glass as it's quenching. If one is willing to hazard a walk in the dark on such treacherous terrain, you can get out and see this happening at night. Doesn't get any better than this. It's worth a walk. Here's Paley eating her spaghetti. Actually, it's the wife of the volcanologist, the, the guy who took the footage, and you know that the wife has to be a patient person, or at least very interested in geology, to walk half the night to see this kind of show.
Okay, cool.